Welcome to History 134, The Napoleonic Era, Part 3, Napoleon's Family and Napoleon's Mistresses. Now, if you are part of my class, this is an optional section. You will not be tested over this, so it's optional. But I think you'll enjoy the juicy gossip just the same. Napoleon came from a very large family. He had seven brothers and sisters, but his mother had actually given birth to 13 children. Five of them had died in infancy. So you have his brothers, Joseph, Jerome, Louis, Lucien, and then the sisters, Carolyn, Elisa, and Pauline. Napoleon's father was Charles Bonaparte, or Carlos Bonaparte. He was born in 1746. He died in 1785, so he's just 39 years old. He was a lawyer, is a minor noble. Now, he supported links to the French and had actually kept his distance with some of the Corsican revolutionaries who wanted independence. That's going to help him earn subsidies for a French education for both Joseph and Napoleon. Now, he dies of stomach cancer. He went to one of the best hospitals available, which was Montpellier. Now, his mother, Letizia Ramolino Bonaparte, the Ramolino family is a very old minor noble family on Corsica. She was born in 1750, lived to 1836. She is known as Madame Mare or Madame Mother. So she lived to be 86 years old. And it's a good thing because all of the money and land and jewelry that was given to her by her children as they dominated Europe, she saved and helped them out during the rest of their lives. She used to always tell them, you need to be putting some of this stuff away for yourself as well. As I said before, she was married at the age of 14 and had 13 children, five of whom died in infancy, but many of them became kings. She was widowed at 35, very well respected by everyone and well taken care of by the Allies, even after the Napoleonic era was over. Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's oldest brother, born in 1768, died in 1844. As you can see in the picture, he has his general's uniform, uniform on, and he also has I'm the King of Spain's outfit as well. He was not only the King of Spain, he was also the King of Naples at one point. He had been, in 1793-94, he'd been a representative of the people in the French government. 1797, he was on the Council of 500 during the Directory. 1807, he became the king of Naples. Him and his wife loved it there. In 1808, he reluctantly became the king of Spain. He really did not want to go to Spain. The Spanish are probably unhappy that he went there as well. They used to call him the bottle. They claimed he was drunk all the time. It's not necessarily true. Unfortunately, he's not very good, not successful in Spain. At the end of the Napoleonic Wars, he settled in Philadelphia from 1815 to 1832, and then for another period between 1837 and 1838. 1839. He spent his last years in Florence. He was married to Julia Clary. 1771, she was born. In 1845, she died. And they had three children, all daughters. Now, she is one of two sisters of the Clary family. Julia married Joseph. He's the first Bonaparte to marry in. And Napoleon was actually engaged to Julia's sister, Desiree. Unfortunately, he met Josephine and so cut off the engagement. And she ends up having to marry somebody else. She ends up marrying Jean-Baptiste Bernadeau, but we'll talk about her a little later. Jerome Bonaparte, born in 1784, died in 1860. He's the king of Westphalia, and that is the outfit that you see him wearing in both pictures. Now, he was in the French Navy from 1800 to 1806, and at that time, he met Elizabeth Patterson in Baltimore, Maryland, and married her in 1803. There's a portrait of her with a beautiful triptych, where you have three different views of the same person. However, Napoleon didn't think this was a good marriage and it was annulled. Ultimately, he divorces Elizabeth and marries Catherine of Württemberg. After that, from 18, well, he's in the military from 18 till 1815, and at the Battle of Waterloo, he is the gentleman <laughs> who ends up wasting all day trying to take the Hugomont and ends up breaking his sword in frustration over his knees. From 1816 to 1847, he just wandered from place to place. 1847, he was made governor of the Anvalide, and and in 1850, he was made a Marshal of France. Now we come to Lucien Bonaparte, 
he is really not that heavily involved in the Napoleonic era. He was born in 1775, lived to 1840, and he was a member of the Council of 500 in 1799. And he certainly was helpful in helping Napoleon overthrow the Directory on 18 Brumaire. But after 1804, he just left and went to live in Rome. Now, his first wife was Christiane Boyer, born in 1771, died in 1800. They had four children. And his second wife, Alexandrine Desblochamps was born in 1778, died in 1855, and she had nine children. So he may not have been involved in the Napoleonic era, but he certainly helped to populate it. Now the Bonaparte family gets interesting. Here is a portrait of Josephine Beauharnais with her two children, Eugene and Hortense. And years later, of course, she will become Napoleon's first wife, and the children will become his stepchildren. Well, one of them ends up marrying his brother. Louis. Louis Bonaparte marries Hortense. Now, Louis was born in 1778, lived to 1846, and was at one time the King of Holland. He was with Napoleon on most of his early campaigns from Italy through Egypt, and he was made General Brigade in 1803 and General Division in 1804, was made King of Holland in 1806, and he was forced to abdicate in 1810 and ultimately died in Italy. But his wife, Hortense, she was born in 1783 and died in 1837. This was not a good marriage. He was not a very loving individual. Actually, it's believed that he was abusive to Hortense. There's at least one occasion where Napoleon believed that he had beaten her and had him beaten as a result and gave him warnings that he would kick him out and take his, his kingdom away from him if he didn't straighten out. I will mention this about Hortense. She has one of the most sensitive books on the Napoleonic era. She knew lots of people. And her two-volume history or diary of the era is quite, quite nice. The picture you see here is one of her three children. She had three children with Louis. They got along somewhat, but that's the future Napoleon III. She also had one illegitimate legitimate child with a lover. Now here we have Hortense's brother, Eugene Beauharnais, born in 1781, died in 1824, was Viceroy of Italy. That's his wife, Princess Augusta of Bavaria. She was born in 1788 and died in 1851, and they had seven children. For a while, he was the aide-de-camp to Napoleon from 1796 to 99, general in 1804, an able commander, did very well at the Battle of Wagram and Borodino, and he is one who takes command of the Russian expedition after Marat leaves, and he and, and uh, Marshal Ney bring the army back. After the war, he spent most of his time in Munich, living in the territory controlled by his, his father-in-law, King of Bavaria. Now it's time for the girls. Here's Carolyn Bonaparte. Now her full name was Maria Annunciata Caroline. Then they call her Carolyn. She was born in 1782, lived to 1839. She was the Queen of Naples at one time and had four children by her husband, Joachim Marat. Now Joachim Marat is an incredible fellow. Now they were married in 1800. Queen of Naples, 1808. She was very popular in Naples. After 1815, she went first to Austria and then ended up in Florence. Now, her husband, who was born in 1767 and 18, died in 1815, is the greatest cavalry commander of the Napoleonic Wars, and he loved wearing fancy uniforms, as you can see here. He was a marshal of France. He was the king of Naples and was actually, I think there's a hundred thousand pound bounty on him if he were to be killed in battle. He loved to lead like huge forces of cavalry in the action. Unfortunately, after Napoleon's fall and the failure of the 1815 100 Days campaign, Marat lost his territory. Him and his wife were thrown out of Naples, but he thought he was popular. So in 1815, he landed in Naples and thought that they would just flock to him. Instead, they arrested him, put him up against the wall and shot him. So you can't win them all. But there's Carol with some of their children. Elissa Bonaparte, born in 1777, died in 1820. She married Felix Boccacci in 1797. Now, they had four children, but she ended up leaving her husband in 1805. They just didn't get along. Uh, she was, For a while, she was Princess of Pombino and then the Princess of Lucca. And in 1809 to 1814, she became the Grand Duchess of Tuscany. She ultimately reconciled with her husband and retired first to Germany, but they ended up living out their lives in Trieste. And here is a portrait showing a, a bust of Elissa being viewed by the Prince of Lucca.
Now it's time for Pauline Bonaparte, born in 1780, died in 1825, Princess Borghese. Now in her early years, she's quite the hot little number. It's an old joke amongst the family that if they didn't find somebody to marry her pretty soon, she was going to end up giving somebody an heir. So her first husband is General Leclerc. They were married in 1797. They had one child, but unfortunately, they weren't married for very long because he died in the Haitian expedition in 1802 of yellow fever. Then in 1803, she married the Prince Borghese, and that comes with the Borghese Palace, which you see here. She spent most of her time in Paris, however, chasing other men and doing what have you. There's a little scandal in the family other than her lovers. It's this bust, a statue. If you go into the Borghese Palace today, one of the most spectacular museums, there is this Canova carving of Pauline reclining. Now, when this was unveiled, they covered it completely over, and her mother, Madame Mare, was given the honor of pulling the drape off. They did not know that she was going to be topless, and Mom fainted. And there's some interesting comments amongst the family about this, but it is spectacular. She died in Florence of tuber either tuberculosis or stomach cancer, but she was a, quite an interesting lady. It's time to talk about Napoleon's loves and mistresses. Now, I've covered Josephine, his wife, first wife, and Marie Louise, his second wife, in the regular presentation. So we're going to talk about his mistresses and his really first girlfriend. But I have to warn you, this first one we're going to look at is Napoleon's supposed first sexual experience. Yes, this is Madame Columba, supposedly the woman who was his landlady, rented him an apartment. I found this in an 1862 book on early Napoleonic history, and it's basically sepia tone drawings and, and other things. And I would assume that this simply shows that during the French Revolution, you just had to find sex where you could find it. The Clary sisters, Julie and Desiree, they did pretty well in their marriages. As you can see, Julie married Joseph Bonaparte, and he became the king of Spain. And so she was the queen of Spain for a while. And Desiree ended up with Marshal Bernadotte, who ultimately became the new king of Sweden in 1810. And she then becomes the queen of Sweden, ultimately. But initially... Here's Desiree. Her full name was Bernadine Eugenie Desiree Clary. Napoleon was head over heels in love with her. Look at those pretty little doe eyes. Now, there's two stories as to what happens here. One version is that her family said one Bonaparte in the family was enough. They, she came from an industrialist background, family background. So she had to break it all. Pretty close to getting married. And it was common at that time that your trousseau, the clothes that you wore on your honeymoon, would be embroidered with the first letter of your new husband's last name. So she had all of her clothes embroidered with B for Bonaparte. So the joke was that she needed to find a husband whose last name was B, and she did. She found Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte. But the other version of this is they were about to get married, and then Napoleon met Josephine, and it was he who ended up breaking off the engagement. At any rate, it turned out very well for her. Pauline Belisle Flores. Now, she was born in 1778 and died in 1869 at the age of 91. Now, Pauline is really one of the first mistresses that Napoleon has after Josephine began cheating on him. She was having an affair with a cavalry officer named Hippolyte Charles, and Napoleon had periodically had a little dabbling here and there. But it reached a point when he was in Egypt that it was common knowledge that Josephine was cheating on him, which meant that he was being cockholded that if your wife cheated on you and you didn't do something, that you were a castrated rooster. So he needed to find somebody who was really good looking and, it, and to get even. Well, Pauline Flores had married this cavalry officer, Jean Noel Flores, and had dressed herself up as a man with, an off with a cavalry outfit so that she could be with her husband on campaign. And she and about 200 other people did exactly the same thing with their lovers. And so during the Egyptian expedition, this little corps of, of ladies became quite the, the party group, and she attracted Napoleon's eye, shall we say. Actually, she was pointed out to him by Josephine's own son, Eugene. So 
Well, eventually they had an affair. Well, the problem is her husband's around. So Napoleon has him do messenger duty. He's supposed to take messages from Egypt, get on a ship, and go back to France. That ought to keep him out of the way for a while. Well, he gets captured by the British. They know exactly what's going on, so they don't put him in prison. They put him back in Egypt. Ultimately, once Napoleon leaves Egypt in 1799, she becomes the mistress of the next commander, General Kleber. On returning to France, she is still a good friend of Napoleon's, and he kind of helps her marry a banker and lives happily ever after. Now, when she dies at the age of 91, she did something unique. When people in the Napoleonic era, when they died, they did different things in their will. For example, General Bertrand, in his will, said that his memoirs could not be published until he had been dead for a hundred years. In Pauline Forres's case, and she knew everybody in society, she stipulated her, her memoirs, her diaries, were to be destroyed after the reading of the will. Otherwise, no one would receive anything and the money would be donated to charity. But she didn't want to injure anybody's reputation. It's an interesting lady. It's a beautiful portrait. My understanding is that portrait that you see to the right is a painting of her when she's in her late 50s. She had long blonde hair in Egypt. She was called the Cleopatra. Now we come to Napoleon's actress-singer phase. This period through to about 1804 is where he's going to be following these ladies. First one I have here is uh, Josephine Marguerite. Now, she's Mademoiselle Georges, one of the greatest singer-actresses of her day. He liked her first name, but said, I'm going to call you Georgina. And, and eventually it's just Mademoiselle Georges. And they're, they're off and on from 1802 to 1804. But later on, she had had an affair with Alexander I of Russia and the Duke of Wellington and supposedly fathered an illegitimate child. Then we have Mademoiselle Mars, who's just simply another another singer, a few months type of thing. And then there's Giuseppina Grassini, 1799 to 1801. She's actually the first singer actress to entice Napoleon. She offered herself to Napoleon before they became close. Unfortunately, he turned her down and she never really forgot it. Eventually, she will dump him for a violinist. I would point out that Mademoiselle Grazzini also had an affair with the Duke of Wellington. Now we come to a unique mistress, Eleanor de la Plon. Now she was born in 1787 and died in 1868. As you see, it says surrogate mistress. She was arranged for by Napoleon's oldest sister, Carolyn. And the issue was this, that Napoleon had been married to Josephine for a while and had not had any children. And Josephine had had two children prior to marrying Napoleon. And they thought that they needed to find out whose fault it was. And at that time, you know, the only kind of sperm testing you use is simply you go and get someone pregnant. So she became highly recommended by Carolyn. And ultimately, after a liaison, she gave birth to a little son who is known as Charles Count Leon. In Napoleon's will, he left money and objects to both of them. Now we come to Napoleon's final mistress, Maria Waluska. She was born in 1786 and died in 1817. And they were together between 1806 and 1810. They met while he was campaigning, trying to get the Russians to stand still after Austerlitz. So this is the Eilau campaign, ultimately to the Friedland campaign. And he's going through what used to be Poland. Former Polish nobles thought it would be a really good thing to have a Polish mistress for Napoleon. So he met her in 1806 at a party and was fascinated by her. But she was married. She was married to a 70-year-old count. But the aristocrats got together, including her husband, that this was a good idea. So they encouraged her to go ahead and become his mistress. And they were very, very close, very good friends. And she indeed became pregnant and gave birth to a son, Alexander. See here. And she you know, wrote to him, visited him when he was on the island of Elba, probably would have gone to St. Helena uh, if she'd have been alive at the time. She actually had, she was married to the, the first count, Count Waluska, and provided a son for him, then had an affair with Napoleon and had a son for him. And then after her husband died, she married a again, and Count Ordonez also received a son as well. The family has been recognized. I mean, her son by Napoleon was recognized by the French government as an official heir. That completes the family of Napoleon and his loves outside of his wives. So I hope you enjoyed that.